This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. You're gonna acknowledge me. It's time for your Monday Night Raw review here on the WWE Podcast. It's Tuesday, April 11th, 2023. And we have a decent Monday Night Raw to talk about. I think it's an improvement over last week. And from what I understand, Vince was not there in attendance. But of course, you know, you got to take what you hear with reports with a grain of salt because. Oftentimes you hear a report and then 15 minutes later, the exact opposite information comes out either way. Even if Vince wasn't there, does it really mean he's still not running the show? We've all been living in a post COVID world in which we've been using zoom WebEx, right? All these virtual conference tools that we have at our disposal to, uh, to be able to talk and discuss and whatever my point is that Vince still could be running things virtually and we'll never know for sure. But as time goes on, the truth seems to reveal itself. So if you are one that is concerned about Vince McMahon running television, all you have to do really is take a look at the product, take a look at it, what it is now and make comparisons to before triple H took over. There may be a lot of similarities and I'm seeing a lot of similarities in what ways? Well, a lack of wrestling, Last week's Monday Night Raw, one of the worst Raws, especially Raw after Manias in recent memory, we had 33 minutes of wrestling on a three-hour show. That was very Vince McMahon-esque. Brock Omas, Vince McMahon-esque. The Draft, Vince McMahon-esque. Having it now be WrestleMania Backlash, that came from Vince McMahon, right? So a lot of evidence does point to Vince having a, a, a at least a significant influence on on the product. And uh, I I think that even if Vince was truly back in charge, that WWE right now is not going to make that public. Why? Because they know it's not a popular decision with the general public. And now that Endeavor is the, 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 the owner and has control over WWE, they can listen to the public and push Vince McMahon back to uh, just a different role in the company. And I don't know if they've done that, if they've, they plan on doing it again, if they've already done it, we don't know, but that's my, I guess, silver lining to those or glimmer of hope for those that do wholeheartedly believe that Vince McMahon is back in charge of creative. All we have to do collectively, of course, is make it known to endeavor and the powers that be at endeavor. They're the ones that now run the show. In terms of not, they're not getting involved in creative, but they can move people around in WWE who are uh, those who are in positions of power that uh, put the creative product out on on TV. That all said, guys, welcome to Monday Night Raw. Uh, We've got a little bit of an announcement here. I'm actually going to be um, interviewed tomorrow by CNBC. You heard that correctly, Uh, (laughs) because... uh, they're doing a, uh, I guess, an article or a web story or a TV. I don't know if it's going to be published on TV. I think at the minimum it's going to be on their website um, where they're asking for reactions. And uh, I got an email today from a reporter at CNBC, and she wants to talk to me for an hour tomorrow on the phone. So I would imagine at some point over the next week or so that uh, yours truly will be in a CNBC article uh, talking about the Endeavor WWE merger. So that is uh, what the, I guess the topic of conversation is going to be. Of course, if you don't think I'm going to use that as an opportunity to plug this podcast, you are a fool. <laughs> um, but it is kind of cool, right? And I get to talk with a, uh, a you know, a, a national news source and uh, see, you know, give my opinion on a national stage, even if it is an article that maybe no one reads. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, it's kind of cool to say. And uh, of course, I'll let you guys know when it's published. Um, and uh, if you want to take a look at that and, and let me know what your feedback is. So again, probably not going to be for a little while. These things aren't very quickly turned around, but just keep on uh, keep on listening to the show and uh, follow us on Twitter at wrestling underscore audio. All right. 
So let's talk about Monday Night Raw. Let's talk about the good. What did I like? I liked the Trish Stratus heel turn. Let's talk about that right off the top. The Trish Stratus heel turn was unexpected, but boy, did it give her a shot in the arm that if you're going to have one last quick run with Trish Stratus before she actually does officially retire for good, a heel turn is one way to do that. A heel turn for a returning legacy star always indicates to you that they have more planned, obviously, right? It's not just your one-off, your greatest hits that we see from so many returning stars. A heel turn indicates a longer-term plan, whether it's maybe a month, six months, a year, who the hell knows? But for the time being, seeing Trish turn heel was fun, and the crowd bought into it on Monday night. And having her turn on Becky after they lost the tag team titles, absolutely, that to me was a shocker. Although not in hindsight why they did it. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. But having Trish, you know, uh, just basically turn her back on Becky after they seemingly kind of made amends and, hey, no problem, you know, don't worry about it. Kind of that conversation that seemed to ensue after the match and they gave each other hugs and then, wham, Trish Stratus hits Becky Lynch in the back of the head and gives her a chick kick and uh, doesn't provide an explanation as to why she did what she did. I guess she's taking the Brock Lesnar approach. Uh, not, honestly, neither of them are good on the microphone, and uh, they, they seem to leave it to others to explain, but we did get a Trish Stratus heel turn, and this presumably leads to a Becky Lynch versus uh, a Trish Stratus match at Backlash. I'm still calling it Backlash. I don't care what the hell Cody Rhodes says, uh, but that's, I would imagine, what they're aiming towards is uh, Becky Lynch versus Trish Stratus, and look, the match, from a quality perspective, it'll be fine. I don't I don't know if you'll even categorize it as really good, maybe good at the at best. And the reason is Trish Stratus, she's athletic. She looks amazing for her age. She did have big contributions back in the day when uh, women were just basically sex objects. She was a wrestler in a sex object world for the women and added credibility along with others. Lita, Ivory, Jazz, right? China. <clears throat> All of them did add credibility to the uh, Victoria, among others, that added to the actual authenticity for women other than just being objectified. But the, the women right now are on a different level. The women right now are, in some, in some ways, better than the men. I mean, you look at the matches at WrestleMania, I, I would imagine that if you took a vote, the best wrestling match on the card would probably be Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte Flair, followed by Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes. So my point in saying all of this is that I don't expect a great match from these two, but it's about story, and that's okay. I don't need every match to be a five-star. It ain't going to happen anyway, but it's cool to see Trish in a different role, other than just a third wheel, which she's been for months now, and to see her in a role that's significant, to see what a nasty Trish looks like at this uh, at this stage of her career is going to be fun. So embrace it. I think it's going to be entertaining. I don't think it'll flop, but if you're looking for a Rhea Ripley, Charlotte Flair classic, it ain't going to happen. We need to, I think from a wrestling perspective, just take it down a few notches. And, you know, again, that's okay. I'm not crapping on the match before it even happens. But, uh, you know, sometimes we see great matches like that and we expect that to be duplicated over and over and it's just not feasible. So, Anyway, that was a massive takeaway from Raw was a Trish Stratus heel turn. It's it's almost crazy crazy that we're thinking or saying that on April 11th now, 2023, we're talking about Trish Stratus turning heel and turning it into one of the bigger stories on Raw. Think about that. I mean, that's 20 years after Trish really had a good run in WWE. It's insane. And that's credit to Trish for keeping up the lifestyle that allowed her to get back in the ring and have some fun for a little while and show a side of her that she hasn't been able to show in a long time. I don't even know the last time Trish was heel. Was it when she was with Test? Wasn't she a manager for Test? I think she was at one point. So, yeah, any, anyway. All right, so that was a big takeaway. The other nice takeaway, uh, as we're on the positive train here, is <clears throat> in uh, Cody Rhodes. And not necessarily what he said, and we'll get to the promo, but more about his selling and his, well, really just not forgetting to sell is what I'm trying to say, because 
with the brutal beatdown that he uh, he sustained at the hands of Brock Lesnar last week, I was concerned that they would, like they have so many times, have that person that got brutally beat down not even, you know, come out like they had just rolled out of bed. You know, they were just on vacation for a week on the beach, sipping margaritas. No, Cody, at least while it was minor, it had an effect and a positive one for clutching his ribs when he came out, you know, and his entrance standing on the ropes, not putting both hands up, holding one, clutching his ribs. That was impactful. I, I would have sold it a little more. Maybe, you know, uh, I don't know, had his arm in a sling or, you know, not saying it's broken or whatever, but just to add a little bit more of an effect, have a, have a soft neck brace on. I don't know. I mean, to me, that's a more realistic uh, approach. And I, I do appreciate this at the very least. Because how many times have we seen beat down, beat down, beat down, and the person just walking out next week like nothing happened? It's such a nice touch. So I, I really appreciated that. And uh, you know, I, I do I, I do think that that is an overlooked detail that has an impact that you don't even know sometimes that you're you know you know you don't know you even need because subconsciously you're trying to get invested into the product, even though you know it's a work. And those are the things that bring you in. So here's a, a little bit of a gripe I have with the Brock Lesnar thing, though, and it it's more on the storyline end of explaining why Brock did what he did. Now, management or the, the storyline is that they have reached out to Brock. It's been radio silence, and that's believable given Brock Lesnar's actual nature as a human being, doesn't want to talk to anybody, he hates people, all that, but... Then they leave it to the announcers to try to provide a narrative. They try to leave it to Paul Heyman, who provides nothing. And the announcers are hinging on that they've heard that Brock is upset with his spot at WrestleMania. That that, that was one of the reasons or the reason why he did what he did to Cody. They, they've brought this up twice now. So it seems as if they're going to be pushing this forward a little bit. I honestly wouldn't even be surprised if we don't hear anything from Brock. At this point, I think that WWE looks at him as, well, we don't need to provide a, an explanation, a real thorough one, because this star power is a, is a nice deodorizer for us having to really think through storylines and provide logical reasons for why, why wrestlers do what they do. And I think they're leaning on that a lot. They did it with Bobby and, and Brock, basically the entire program. We still don't know why they they were fighting. But... uh here's the thing. Here's the logic. And I know Cody provided one too. We'll get there. But with management telling us on raw that, Oh, Brock was upset, right? He was upset with Cody's position on the card and, and Brock's position on the card. Well, here, here's a couple of problems with this. If this is what they go with in part or in whole, well, isn't Brock the one that always talks about wanting to be on first so that he can just get the hell out of there and go home. And how many times do you hear about that? So shouldn't Brock have been excited that he was the first one on night two instead of the last one on night two so he could just get the hell home? And how many times have we heard that Brock is basically here to be, he's a businessman, right? And he's here to collect a paycheck, kick ass, and leave. Uh, And that's what he does. So again, those are just two reasons that this doesn't make any sense. On top of the fact that, again, this isn't just... This doesn't make sense for Brock. When the hell has Brock Lesnar cared about what position on the card he is in in uh, comparison to other stars on the card? When has that ever, in Brock Lesnar's 20-plus year career, has that ever been a thing that he's complained about in story or in, in real life? I don't know. It's, it's just They're just creating this out of whole cloth. Just, just that, uh, you know, uh, just bippity boppity boo, and all of a sudden Brock suddenly is a a drama queen about where his position is on the card. What? Are they really that desperate to ha- have a reason? Now, I I at least appreciate they're trying to give us a reason because I could also see where they just don't give us one at all. But I also don't want to get complacent in my expectations for WWE to provide us basic storytelling, and that's what I'm trying to avoid while. In the past, they've oftentimes not explained why someone did what they did or anything else, and they just go with no explanation at all and just have the fans fill in the blanks or that they think it's just, quote, implied. I don't want to get to that point of complacency as a fan where I set the bar that low that I let WWE off the hook. Uh Uh-uh. 
ain't happening. All right. So, uh, and the other thing is this, okay. If, if Brock got his way, well, first of all, it's WrestleMania. We all know that the title match goes on last end of story, which is nine times out of 10, the, the, uh, the, the, the formula for any pay-per-view at all is the title match goes on last. Right. But even if Brock were to go on last in the title match, well, here's the problem, Brock, you can't compete for the title because Roman Reigns is champion. You see like five or six layers of why this doesn't make sense at all. It's Brock, <laughs> apparently all of a sudden Brock's a drama queen that doesn't understand that he can't compete for the WWE uh, universal undisputed championship anymore because he lost to Roman at SummerSlam, which was part of the stipulation. And, uh, all of a sudden he's completely changed the nature of who he is as a human being of, you know, wanting to stay for the whole show and not wanting to get back on a plane back to his home behind his eight foot uh, vinyl fence or 10 foot vinyl fence and, and barricade himself under his pillows, which is what he does. Right. And I don't mean that to be insulting. I, I actually relate very heavily with this man. If I could, I would have an eight foot or 10 foot vinyl fence around my house. In fact, I would, I might even have a, a, a ceiling of vinyl fence. Right. So like, even if you are above me in elevation, you can't see into my house or into my yard. I mean, that, that's what I would like. I, I don't want to see anyone. <laughs> it's just like, like, and it's not that I don't like you or that I, you know, I, 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 somebody, if I have neighbors that anybody should take it personally, I just don't want to see anyone. When I go outside, I don't want to have to make conversation. I don't want to have to talk to you. I'm out there to just zone the F out. All right. I know this is a bit of a side rant. <laughs> But, and you know, and I have good, I have great neighbors. I have no complaints about the, who they are, but for me, I don't want to see you. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to have to make fake small talk. Just get away from me. I'll pretend you, you don't exist. You pretend I don't exist and we'll go on our merry ways. But some people love it. Some people live for howdy neighbor. How you doing today? Oh, I see you're doing yard work, dude. F off. I, 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 I know guys, I'm sorry. I'm on a, a side rant. This is probably more suited for a after dark episode, <laughs> but I don't look, some people are the antithesis of who I am and I'm the antithesis of who you are maybe, but that's why we all are different. We all balance each other out. Uh, I am very much, I'm an introvert at heart, but I can fake being social, but I'm also one of those people that like, I can fake being social very well. Alcohol certainly helps, right? It helps us all. It's a social lubricant, but after I'm done faking the socialness, my battery is at E like I need a week to recover from talking to people. And, and it's just, and here's the thing too. People love to talk about themselves. <laughs> so people, all you have to do is ask people questions because they're really not interested in what you're doing. They just want to tell you what they're doing and the good things they're doing and, and, you know, prop themselves up. And that's the best way I'm telling you, if you want to make friends of which I don't, but if you do I'm telling you the best way to do it is just ask questions and listen, that's it. Yeah, because how many times you talk to somebody and you're just like sitting there going, shut up, stop talking, please. Right. All right. Side rant over done. Sorry. Back to raw. Uh, maybe I'll make this a more full fledged episode of after dark for those of, the, of those of you on Patreon, of which, by the way, you can join us on Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash WWE podcast, where you get this exclusive podcast of after dark. A, a very much adult version of, of this show, not really wrestling related, more of just life and uh, definitely are sometimes X rated. Okay. So if you're interested in such things, join us on Patreon at the SmackDown tier and higher, you get that podcast. All right, back to raw. So the flimsy explanation by the announcers of Brock changing who he is as a person, not, you know, not, not to, uh, Having any kind of common sense, suddenly he's lost that. It doesn't make any sense. But then we get to Cody's explanation. And look, Cody knows how to fire up a crowd. He's very good on the mic. He does and looks the part. And the crowd is still with him. So good. Great. And Cody's a hell of a talent. But his explanation, I mean, he again, he challenged Brock to a match at Backlash. Cool. Fine. That seems to be the main event as Roman Reigns takes another pay-per-view off. And... um Again, that's kind of a half complaint, but kind of half complacency as well. But here's Cody's explanation, and this is paraphrasing, is that he was attacked because he was here to bring change, uh, and Brock didn't like that. I mean, again, very. I'm, I'm putting it in very simpleton terms, but that's essentially what he said. 
he's somebody who's here to be a disruptor and that he's here to bring change and Brock doesn't like that. What, by the way, when the hell has Brock also cared about what anyone else is doing other than Brock Lesnar? Right? Like, what, what, what is that even supposed to mean? And by the way, what change are you talking about, Cody? What, what have you changed exactly? Nothing. I mean, your, your promos are good to very good, sometimes outstanding. I'll give you that. But that's not anything that's atypical. I mean, you do have some people that are very good at promos. Roman Reigns, as as of late. John Cena, anytime he comes back. Austin Theory, I think, is very good. So, what change have you brought about? And 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 that, by the way, like if you're here to change things, that's the first I'm hearing of it. Last I knew, your mission, your life's mission since returning was becoming the champion your father never could. What are you even talking about? That doesn't make any sense from Cody's character perspective, of which he's shown nothing and no evidence there. And also from Brock Lesnar's perspective of, uh, even if that was Cody's mission, all right? He said that week after week after week, I'm here to bring change, 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 which is really what CM Punk said he wanted in the summer of Punk in 2012. Um, But... Like that's not, he's not CM Punk. He's Cody Rhodes and he's just kind of like fit back in. He won the rumble. Bam. He's the main event of WrestleMania. He's not implemented any change. Never has he said he ever wants to implement change. (laughs) So, uh, but even if he had said it, let's give Cody the benefit of the doubt and play pretend. Why would Brock Lesnar give a damn? Why, why would Brock care about what change Cody's trying to implement? So on every level, both of these explanations make zero sense. And I know some of you are like, why are you spending so much time on the why? If we don't have a coherent why, you're not going to care, at least you shouldn't, or most people won't, care about the in-ring. Because if you don't have a reason why someone's doing something, it's it's a massive missed opportunity to get people truly emotionally invested. And I think that they're missing that right now with Cody and Brock. Other than just, oh, he, you know, Brock beat me down and um I want revenge. Okay. Like, duh. But the biggest thing here is why Brock, why? And uh, maybe we'll get more of an explanation as we move forward. Um, Paul Heyman also calling Solo Sokoa on Raw the sergeant at arms. What a great, great analogy. That that is exactly what he is. Mr. Stoicism over there. Uh, And also think about this. To my knowledge, I could be wrong. I've known to be. I just asked my wife. But I don't think Solo Sokoa has ever said a word at all since coming up to the main roster. I don't think he said anything outside of yelling in his matches, you know, Samoan, but on the microphone, holding a microphone and speaking. And the reason I point that out is not to complain, but more to give praise and say I'm impressed because. For him to be this over and this respected in the eyes of fans without saying a word is damn impressive. It's credit to the to creative. It's credit to also mostly Sol Sokol himself for, for execution, perfection execution, right? So just think about that for a minute. All right. So uh, the match, by the way, the women's tag team title match, obviously we talked about the Trish turn. But uh, the tag team title match itself, I thought, with Liv Morgan and Raquel Rodriguez versus Lita, or rather, excuse me, not Lita, but uh, Becky Lynch and uh, Trish Stratus, the match itself I thought was really good. Actually, exceeded my expectations. Of course, you got your usual botch or sloppiness from Liv, and Liv has not been on a good roll lately. Um, some of her moves just, uh, she shouldn't be making those mistakes at this point in her career, and she needs to, I, I think, personally, uh, reinvent her finish. Oblivion is too sloppily, more often than not, executed. And it's not necessarily because the talent aren't ultra athletes and all that, but because the level of difficulty of making Oblivion look devastating and executing it without also not injuring yourself or your opponent is unnecessarily high. So I I would get rid of Oblivion. I don't know, come up with something else. Um, But that's just one man's opinion. However, the match was generally really good. I think the false finish 
of having um, the manhandle slam and then having Raquel was a believable non-finish. I actually thought they were going to retain. I thought there was no chance of having them lose the belts because I figured, hey, Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler are going to show up. Ronda and uh, Becky are going to go face to face and you're going to have Lita and uh, Shayna Baszler go face to face. Well, that hasn't happened and it didn't happen and I was completely wrong. So I have no idea what they are doing with Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler. They didn't compete hardly at all at WrestleMania, even though they won. And yet, even though they won, another team that lost (laughs) that very match got the opportunity at the women's tag team titles and became champions before they did. Uh, that, that, I mean, again, it's a minor complaint, but it's also a kind of, it, it's a, it's an example of a larger problem. Microcosm, I think is the word. And it just doesn't make any sense. But if Ron is injured or Shane is injured, or they just have no creative for them, then don't make that. Don't, don't, don't let them win the match. Now, to be fair, now they'll have SmackDown for the time being, unless the draft shakes everybody up here, <clears throat> for Shayna and Ronda to take on Liv and uh, and Raquel Rodriguez. So that'll be fun. But we've already seen Ronda and, Ra- and Raquel Rodriguez even recently have a couple of matches over the last several months. And Shayna Baszler is ice cold. And Liv Morgan is... I don't know what she is anymore. So... It's not the most interesting matchup. I mean, I don't know how Becky Lynch and Lita didn't have this match, but I don't know. We'll see what happens on SmackDown. But I'd imagine now uh, that you have a team that actually can compete regularly in Liv and Raquel that you're able to present opponents right away. And it probably is Ronda and Shayna if they are not um, uh, injured in any way. So, But the match I thought was really good. I, I, I did enjoy the match more than I thought I would. And, of course, a very surprising ending there. Now, on to, uh, let's see, I was going to talk about the main event, but uh, let's, let's save that a little bit. I'm going to go with, uh, right, what open Raw? Rey Mysterio and Finn Balor. And before the match, though, I have to talk about that because uh, we did have Rey wearing an LWO t-shirt, spoke about his recent stretch of highs and lows, and about being inducted to the Hall of Fame. And about facing Dominic at WrestleMania, how he wanted things to be different. Dominic came out and he said, keep my name out of my, your mouth. (laughs) Whatever. A little bit of a flub there. It's fine. But Dom that said, Ray makes things about himself and never cared about him and said he's, he's better off with his real family, the Judgment Day. And Ray said the Judgment Day are selfish idiots who are just using his son. And Dom said he would have beaten Ray at Mania had it not been for Bad Bunny interfering. And then we saw what happened. And um, let's see. Uh, Ray asked Dom when he was going to man up and fight on his own. And Ray called for Dom to face him in a a WrestleMania rematch on the spot. And Dom said he couldn't fight his own father. (laughs) Uh, But he knew he would fight Ray instead. And then Finn Balor. uh, Finn Balor made his entrance. And we got a Ray Mysterio Finn Balor matchup. I mean, good stuff. Dom did get a little bit tripped up a couple of times. It happens. All right. Dom handled it fine. And it's good that he's going through these things now that Dom is, you know, you're going to have on air flubs, even multiple flubs in your promo where you misspeak, say something you shouldn't. Uh, you know, it's just, it's going to happen. We're human beings. I do it every few minutes on this podcast, right? <laughs> so it, it's just being human and it's fine. So, uh, but the match here with Ray and Dom, I'm sorry, Ray and Finn was really good. But also when Dom said that he wouldn't, he couldn't fight his own father. I mean, this is just, this is gold Ugh, and nuclear heat for Dom. It's just so beautiful. But, um, all right. So a few minutes in the match, we got a head scissors takedown. I'm not going to go through everything, but, uh, this was a really nice match. Long match in about 14 minutes. Finn Balor beat Ray Mysterio. Uh, Ray had fought off, uh, Dominic, and a priest, but eventually had succumbed to uh, the distractions and Dom did hit his father in the head with a chain and uh, that allowed Finn to hit the coup de grace for the victory. So continuing the heat, Bad Bunny will be back and this is clearly, clearly heading towards a tag team match at... Um, at the uh, backlash event in Puerto Rico. No doubt about that. So 
good stuff. I, I really have no problem with this. And, and Dom continues to be brilliant. Ray continues to play his part very nicely. And I like Corey Graves mentioning on Raw about how Rey Mysterio is aging in reverse. That's, a, I mean, exactly. How is Rey Mysterio still this good right now? I, I mean, I, I thought that there was a chance that Rey Mysterio could retire at WrestleMania, given that he's facing his son. It's WrestleMania. What a great way to go out. It's a dream, right? And it didn't happen, which is fine. I don't have no problem with it, but I figured there's a chance, right? He's aged. He's got a lot of mileage on his body. You know, he's, he's, there's nothing more he could do to his career to you know elevate it any further. He's already at the top. Um, he, he brought Lucha Libre style of wrestling into the mainstream, all that. But he's continuing his career. And it's again, it's not a complaint. I, I really just, I, I just want to make the observation, and I think it's important to bring this up to just everyone listening. Ray Mysterio right now, he eventually will succumb to age. And I don't mean die, like although we all are. <laughs> but I mean, from a professional standpoint, eventually he's going to have to step aside. And there are 100%, there's a 100% chance that there are more days behind them than in front of him. I would argue that he's probably got six to 12 months left. I'd say WrestleMania 40, that could, he could, be, could be his curtain call along with Edge. And my point about all this is to say not to get you disappointed, but to enjoy the time you see Rey Mysterio in the ring right now. Because when we look back in five, 10 years as fans, we're going to go, oh my God. Like, you, you know, you'll see other wrestlers come along in the Lucha Libre style, but you're like, they're just never as good as Rey. Man, Rey was so good for so long, right? Anytime a wrestler comes up, like Ultimo Dragon, right? Uh, or others, I can't think of other, uh, some other names. Me- the, no, I'm not going to say the Mexicools. Uh, by the way, imagine WWE bringing back the Mexicools. Think about that. Think of WWE bringing back the Mexicools in Puerto Rico. I think I just heard the faint sound of the country exploding. Think about that. If, if you don't know what the Mexicools are, uh, Google it. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Those of you that know, know. I don't know how I got on that sidebar, but I, I just wanted to bring the attention to just appreciating and enjoying Rey Mysterio while we have him because you never know when he might call it a career. God forbid he has an injury. I mean, again, he's more prone to injury given the age of his body and the mileage, the bumps. My God, the bumps he's put his body through. So again, I'm not preaching it's more of just an observation because oftentimes we take wrestlers for granted, even when they are legends in their prime and we just take them for granted. They're going to be there on a wrestling regular basis, have wrestling matches every week, blah, blah, blah. No, Rey Mysterio doesn't need to do this right now. Rey Mysterio doesn't need to be there, especially on a weekly basis. He could be easily on the Roman Reigns schedule or the Brock Lesnar schedule, but he's choosing to be there. I think a lot of it has to do with his son and I totally understand that, but he doesn't need to be doing this. And I think a lot of people have overlooked that and just taken it for granted. Oh, it's Ray. He'll be there. Right? He'll, he'll have a match tonight. I don't know. I, I, I just kind of came to that realization Monday and to enjoy the time we have with Ray because the daylight is fading. And same with Edge. Same goes with Edge. I know he is the king of comebacks. Okay. We all know that. <laughs> He's gone back into hiding until maybe Saudi Arabia or Money in the Bank in the O2 Arena, wherever. And, and that's kind of Edge's schedule. And I totally get that too. He's... Just, uh, you know, he's putting his body through a lot of hell, pun intended, to elongate his career and give him the, the finish he wants to give his career. But he has a very limited number of matches left in his body, too. So just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a, a perspective as I, I, I wanted to play daddy tonight. I don't know. Anyway, things are getting weird. Let's move on. Um. So the match was really good here with uh, Finn Balor beating Ray. Then we get, again, the tag team title match, which I already went over with the women. Um, we then got Bobby Lashley versus Bronson Reed. Lashley uh, fought Bronson to a double countout in about 10 minutes. Lashley went for a spear. Ray, Reed cut him off with a kick. Reed then ran the ropes and was put down with Lashley, but uh, with a spine buster by Lashley. 
Lashley set up for his finish. He was unable to lock the fingers, and Reed walked towards the ropes with both men tumbling to the floor. Lashley got up and clotheslined Reed and then uh, tried to hoist him up for a turnbuckle spot, but Reed slipped away and shoved Lashley into the ring post, and they were both counted out. I don't hate this. I like it. It's about time they get away from the squash stuff with Bronson. And Lashley and Bronson Reed, double count out. I'm cool with it because you don't want to have Reed beat Lashley. He's not ready for that type of victory yet. But you also don't want Lashley to just beat Reed yet because they've done, they've laid the foundation for Reed to be a monster. And you don't want to just define him down by having Lashley put him in his place at this point in his career because he's building a lot of momentum. So, This seems to be a match that I would imagine we're going to get at Backlash with probably Bronson Reed getting the victory. I I think whether it's by hook or crook, that is likely of what's uh, going to happen. And I'm glad Lashley's also back in the picture helping build new stars. And he's not just, you know, holding a trophy over his head at WrestleMania, for God's sakes. All right. What else do we have here? (laughs) Um, We have Jimmy Uso and Jey Uso, the Usos, obviously. Facing Alpha Academy, and this one ended with uh, the Usos beating the uh, Alpha Academy in about 13 minutes, and uh, it ended with Gable getting a 1D, and then Jay covered Gable and got the victory. So fine. This one, um, this is exactly, it was just to get the Usos on the event. By the way, if they're SmackDown stars, here's a perfect example of why the draft makes no sense. And uh, anyway, so they brought them back to Raw, even though they're superstars on SmackDown, drafted technically from the last draft. And they don't have the tag team titles anymore, so there's no excuse for them to be here other than just, hey, we've got three hours to fill. You guys are the hottest thing in wrestling right now in terms of uh, storyline. We need you here. Fans don't care. Let's do this. I want to see WWE do this with no wiggle room. I really, I, I want to like this draft. If you haven't heard my discussion with Anthony DeMarco that we had for about 45 minutes yesterday, check it out. We, we d- kind of went into this in depth of the pros and cons of the, the draft and who could come up and the things we uh, are fearful of, the things that we're looking forward to. But right now, um, I mean, they're, they're violating the draft right now from last time, which I know was a couple of years ago, but still. Either way, the match here was good. You can't not have a good match here. Usos are probably the best tag team in the world. And I don't say that facetiously. I mean that literally. But I, I would stack them up against really any tag team in any promotion. They are the best tag team from every lo- on every level. And by a wide margin, I would argue. Because they're a well-oiled machine. They, especially Jay, have excellent, excellent acting ability. And in the ring, they are second to none. They know who they are. They have a great finish. Yeah, they're ripping off the Dudley boys. Who cares? Look at Kevin Owens taking the stunner or, you know, everyone in the world taking Shawn Michaels super kick or Seth Rollins taking the pedigree, right? Who cares? Charlotte Flair taking her father's figure four. Go down the list. You know, so um, anyway, the Usos get a victory. Not really a meaningful one, but more to fill time and have a good wrestling match. All right. Then we get an interesting match here. EO Sky, Piper Niven, and Meechin in a triple threat for a shot at the Raw Women's Championship. By the way, no Bianca Belair. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand. Anyway, I'll talk about that in a minute. This was a good match. And EO Sky won by pinning Piper Niven and, uh, in about eight minutes. It was interesting because this might have spelled the end of damage control and a face turn for, um, for, for EO Sky. And the reason is that Bailey was advocating for herself at Adam Pierce's office to get a shot at the women's cha- t- uh, Raw Women's Championship by putting herself into the triple threat. And then EO and Dakota were angry and saying, this should be about us. Why, why is it always about you, basically? And Bailey's like, fine, fine. Okay, didn't know you avoided, didn't know you felt this way, and advocated to then put Eo Sky in. So Eo Sky takes the place of Bailey in that triple threat and wins. So now you're going to have jealousy break out among Bailey and Eo Sky, and 
uh, I would imagine that in the uh, Raw Women's Championship matchup, when it does happen with Io Sky and um, and Bianca Belair, I don't know if it's going to happen on a Raw or it's going to happen at Backlash, but I would imagine that Bailey's going to cost Io Sky, and they're going to go into a program and damage controls no more, and they all go on their separate ways, and you have a hopefully a new star in Io Sky, of which. Boy, do they need to do something with both of those women, Eos Guy, Dakota Kai as well. So that's, I think, the plan because Bailey's going to look at us and say, hey, I gave you this opportunity. That should have been me. I would have won this match if I were in that position and I handed it to you. You know, you are the, you are ungrateful, all this. I mean, it's rights itself. So I think that's what's going to happen. Now, <clears throat> um, by the way, Backlash, Cody's the only one in his promo earlier in the night that said WrestleMania backlash. And I wanted to super kick him in the face because I was thinking, don't give WWE any ideas or or remind them. You know, I was wondering, you know, when he said that, because none of the announcers have said it, none of the graphics have shown WrestleMania backlash, but I'm sitting there thinking, Hey, Cody, shut up because you're going to, you're going to remind Kevin Dunn, Oh, that's right, guys. This is WrestleMania backlash. It's not just regular old backlash. So I don't know. Cody just uh, either towing the company line or it actually is WrestleMania backlash or Cody just remembered that that's what last year's was named. I don't know. But to me, it's still backlash. And the logo still just shows backlash. So I know I make a big deal about this, but anyway. All right. So uh, then uh, we got Kevin Owens and Solo Sokoa in the main event that lasted 13 minutes. Good match. Kevin Owens selling the knee, although selectively selling the knee. You know, at times he couldn't even walk, while at other times he could suddenly have the weight of two men on his shoulders and then do a swanton off the top rope. <laughs> it's just, you know what I mean? Um, I'm not crapping on Kevin Owens. This is just kind of a, a um, really a, a just an industry-wide issue of the lack of selling or selective selling. But I understand why he did what he did. Like, you know, he's just powering through the pain, but then he suddenly can't walk. And then he he has a soul's co on his shoulders. And then, you know, all of a sudden he can he can withstand the weight of two men one minute and he can't withstand the weight of his own body weight the next. And then he can't, you know, uh, he can't do a uh, a cannonball in the corner, but then he can, you know, do a swan time. It's just uh, <laughs> I'm not complaining. It's just an observation because we see it all the time. But I do appreciate the selling and for nothing, you know, not for nothing. Selling even in a limited capacity makes a difference. Does it not in a match? It tells a great story. Having a baby face injured in a match is it it adds, even if it's done half heartedly or not fully, it's still fun because it tells a good story generally. But, uh, it was announced earlier in the night though, that, uh, Sammy, and uh, Riddle were not there because they had flight delays. So Kevin Owens was going it alone. And th- this was weird to me because, like, are are they not on the same plane? Like, why? <laughs> I mean, Kevin and Sammy are, you know, BFFs. They're going to the same city. They're best friends in real life. Why the hell aren't they on the same plane again? I don't know. But I digress. It was for storyline purposes. We've seen the flight delay story play out many times over the years, and it's fine. It's believable. But I just wanted to point that that little bit of a kind of question in my mind. They're best friends yet. They're on different flights. I don't know. Anyway, so the match was really good. Solo Sokoa continues again, as I mentioned earlier, to feel every bit the machine and sergeant at arms that he is. And putting on really good matches, he's still got some work to do. And eventually he will have to talk. Okay. He can't just be like this forever, but for him to be this successful and reach this level without saying a word, of course, being associated with the bloodline and one of the best wrestling storylines in a decade doesn't hurt. And having Samoan blood and the lineage and all that absolutely helps. But still, uh, that said, Solo Sokoa ends up uh, getting the victory. And that's when the beatdown ensues from the Usos and we see Kevin or Kevin Owens getting beat down. And then uh, we see Sammy and Riddle arrive. They come out to make the save. Eventually, Kevin Owens hits a stunner on Jimmy. And, uh, you know, so he doesn't sustain a 
too severe of a beat down, but still, um, we, we get that, uh, three on three stare down of Sammy, Kevin and Riddle against the Usos and Solo Sokoa. Can you smell a tag team match coming for uh, backlash? Yeah, I can too. And that's fine. You know, I, I think that's, uh, that, that's absolutely plausible. And I mean, imagine the match on that. I mean, the match quality of that six man tag of the proposed one, the, the, the projected one that I've just given you is, I mean, it could be a match of the night. If it happens at backlash, I'm just starting to formulate. I know I've given you a lot of potentials, but yet nothing obviously is confirmed other than Brock versus Cody at uh, backlash is a lot of moving uh, projections forward. And again, none of this is confirmed, but I like to formulate to at least the next pay-per-view. So I, I'm not trying to spread rumors or, you know, make myself the smartest person in the room. It's just kind of sometimes looking at it as common sense. And that said, common sense is not always common practice, right? All right. So overall, I thought it was a good show. I thought it was better than last week, but that's not saying much. Um, you know, I, I think that it's continuing to build towards backlash. Um, yeah, whether Triple H is fully in charge or it's a hybrid of Vince or Vince's and they're pretending that Vince is not and they, they know that they he need to hide it because the fans will uproar. Who knows? Um, uh, for right now, I'm just going to say it's some kind of hybrid of Vince and Triple H. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll have to see, of course, as the months and weeks go on that if it is Vince or if it's not or if it ever was. I mean, well, eventually this whole story will come out. Eventually they'll do a damn documentary about it. But uh, since we're living in it in the moment, we're not going to hear about it yet. But um, all right. Well, that concludes my raw review, everybody. I really appreciate you listening. And uh, again, follow us on Patreon if you want to get an ad-free experience. Patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Or you can uh, go on Apple Podcasts, get an ad-free experience by clicking ad-free. And also, don't forget, guys, uh, I'll be tweeting out the link whenever it happens uh, for my CNBC interview uh, regarding just my thoughts and comments on the Endeavor WWE merger that I'll be uh, conducting with them tomorrow. And uh, hopefully it comes out. I mean, hey, uh, whatever comes of it, comes of it. It's just kind of cool, right? I think it's uh, not something that happens every day. And uh, it's not like your local news station, right? Like they're a nationally accredited uh, news source. No, not getting into politics of fake news or whatever. And I heard it all. But the fact is that they are a major news, um, a news outlet in the United States. So that's kind of cool, right? So, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and uh, take care. As always, I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com and for all of these shows ad free head over to patreon.com slash wwe podcast until then we'll see you next time